This episode is brought to you by Hub24, whose purpose is to connect advisors to innovative solutions that create opportunity. They're massive supporters of advisors, in particular those going solo, uh, and they're one of the early players in the managed account space, and, and their epic functionality in that area, as well as their commitment to user experience, has led them to become a market leader in terms of advisor satisfaction. I can speak from personal experience when I say their BDM team are total legends, and they're there to help you work through the best solutions for your business. So you can check out more information at hub24.com.au. This episode is also brought to you by Centuria, who are a boutique ultra high performing fund manager. They've won pretty much all the awards there are to win. Uh, They've got a bunch of five star rated funds and they're heavy into technical support for advisors around their products and strategies. On top of that, they're just an awesome group of people and they've got a dedicated team there to support you. And if you haven't already spoken to the guys at Centuria and heard about what they do, do yourself a favor and reach out. Brad Fox, did he throw you under the bus? <laughs> did, Brad, did Brad Fox throw me under the bus? Mate, you've come in at a very challenging time, Phil. Mark did assure me that all the, uh, the, the heavy stuff was over and it would be plain sailing from here. How's that going for you? Oh, look, I came to the, F, the, the AFA to make a difference, so um, in a positive way. So yep. if, uh, if I can't make a positive difference right now, then there'll never be an opportunity. Yeah, I, I suppose that's a good point. Um, I think you, you've, you've clearly been under the spotlight uh, a lot in, uh, in recent times. I think the, uh, in contrast to, to some other uh, uh, people that have been involved, I think that the stand you've taken has been very supportive of the advisors. So I think uh, clearly it's a testing time, but well done for your work so far. Hopefully not too much more to come. Well, I mean, as I say, it's a testing time. It is a very emotional time. I mean, what we're going through at the moment, whether it's professional standards, Royal Commission, we're talking about people's livelihoods, we're talking about the future, we're talking about careers that are people have built up over, over many years. So it is a, a very emotional time. We're talking about a public perception um, that doesn't represent the majority of experiences that, that people who have financial advisors have, you know, mm. as, as we know. People who have financial advisors generally they, they cherish that relationship. Yeah, and it sounds almost like from uh, from some of the things that I've read that uh, they're they're questioning should we even be able to have ongoing fee arrangements. That's just saying should we be able to have ongoing relationships with with our clients? Like uh, it seems to be be an extreme sort of position. Well, I, I guess when you get something like this, as I say, with the Royal Commission, you are going to challenge at extremes. Mm. I mean, the Royal Commission didn't set out to go and find positive experiences and you know, yeah. find a couple that you know retired happily and you know have had ten years of planning for that, thanks to their financial advisor and and uh, you know are, are happy financially, happily happy you know emotionally. Um, that's not what the Royal Commission was out mm. to find out. Yeah, and I think... Assuming that's what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, look... We I, did go straight into it, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We we'll, may as well cut to the chase. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I also think, you know, same with the share market crash. Uh, the world's going to end. It's not just a correction that might be fixed the week later. Mm. Uh, you know, all the media will be out there saying this is the world's ending because it sells newspapers and... Uh, this World Commission, uh, the actual, there's some horror stories that have come out of it and mm. they need to be addressed, but it's not stopped the media saying oh, uh, good, this should good be headlines. The, yeah, it should be the end of the whole financial planning industry. So, yes, yeah. we need some common sense to come back into this discussion. Yeah, definitely. And I think if you if you shine the light brightly enough on uh, on any industry, you, you're going to see uh, you're going to see bad things. I was uh, talking to a client before in, a, in the advertising industry and she was talking about some dodgy stuff with visas that they're um, like just for, for advertising campaigns. Um, so I, th- I think it's just it's uh, yeah as you say they're, they're not they're not out there looking for the for the good news stories. No, but but what we know is one poor experience is one poor experience too many. Yes, um, and there's always going to be more attention on our profession because we're managing people's money. Absolutely, um, there's a compulsory yeah. superannuation environment, so it's forcing money into this system. And when there's money involved, at times, unfortunately, there will be people there with the wrong intentions. Well, it's a conflict is, uh, you know, money is good. People like money. But, people uh, do like money and it's, financial it's advisors tempting. help people make more money and yeah. feel so, confident. So on balance, do you think that the Royal Commission is, is a good thing? Uh, I have to say, 
I went into this thinking that the Royal Commission uh, wasn't needed and I've had to say my mind's been changed. Uh, it's definitely, you know, with so much legislative changes right going right back, FSR, FOFA, MySuper, LIF now and now FASIA, uh, you know, our industry has been hit pretty hard in all areas of financial planning. But some of the um, stories have come out and some of at the high end of uh, the management in the banks, I just did not know was happening. So I have actually changed my mind and yeah, so. I think that's, that's the point. Uh, what we've looked at from our perspective, I mean, there were a few examples of, of bad advice, of poor advice, but I don't think anyone was really expecting the extent of systemic issues at an institutional level that came out over the, you know, the majority of the two weeks. And, I, I yeah. and, the, and the quantum um, that impacted you know, people, both in the numbers of people impacted and the dollar terms. Um, now, I know ASIC obviously has been working on this for some time, but I don't think anyone sort of knew the extent to which um, that, uh, you know, some of the fees for no advice uh, had panned out. Yeah. So, yes, there were some, some poor um, advice examples, but that wasn't the majority of what was on show over two weeks. And as we know, it's not representative of the, the majority of financial advice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm keen to talk about this, uh, the, the trail commissions thing, but um, I suppose on, just on that with, the, with, the, with ASIC and the, the regulation, clearly it's easier for them to, to, to monitor um, and regulate on five larger uh, licensees <clears throat> but um you, you know do they do they have the capacity to if if uh, people move t- towards that more self-licensed model and are they even conflicted in um their you know they they want to uh, maintain to be able to make it easy for themselves to to regulate a, a, a relatively smaller group of licensees as opposed to the thousands of advisors that are out there yeah, that's that's a good question because the answer and and you know we heard ASIC on the last um, last day say that they basically don't have um, the capacity to to monitor um, uh, as much as they would like, and the best approach for them is the one to many through the the major institutions, uh, and that's what they've managed to do. There are those who've experienced the other hand where they've gone to the absolute you know detail for the small advisor down the road. Um, so whilst they're doing that, um, it also seems that a lot's been going on that either they've been monitoring and regulating, waiting for something to happen, or hasn't been seen. And, yeah. you, and you've also got to re- uh, remember that with the whole FASIA, that's uh, for whoever wishes to become one, becomes a code monitoring body, uh, and that will be a proactive way to monitor advisors and to look at their advice. Whereas, you know, if the AFA and the FBA or whoever becomes a code monitoring body, that is actually doing the work on behalf of ASIC. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, ASIC will get more powers, but they're also transferring some of that um, monitoring onto the associations, whoever wishes to become a pro- code monitoring body. Mm. And you think that's why they've been so harsh on the on the association? in particular around the you know potential conflicts with you want to obviously you want to grow your member base and support advisors but then there's all these issues with you know reporting on advisors and um picking up so issues for royal commission or asic uh um, yeah for the for the royal commission I mean. okay for the royal commission well uh phil was there so he can probably talk better to on that <laughs> i'm sure he'd probably prefer <laughs> to forget yes but I'm one sure of the, everyone else would prefer to forget either. But one of the things they did highlight, and, and we actually uh, see the the positives of that, is that the disciplinary committee. You know, a, a lot of the times ASIC could be working and looking at an advisor for two or three years, and until they get banned, we as an association don't know that's one of our members. Yeah. So there is definitely that uh, reporting across associations or between licensees uh, that needs to be improved, and that's one of the main things that that the Royal Commission picked up on the associations. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of good points were raised and, and some questions are raised about the future and as far as code monitoring bodies and, and code schemes are concerned. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, the one thing about the Royal Commission, particularly since we're not actually an entity that's under the scope, going into that, we're wondering what, you know, what are they... What's the narrative? What are they looking for? Yeah, we I remember the discussion we had about that and you were so, you, you was so pretty late notice and... They finally find find out the, what they're what they're looking at, sort of thing. Well, you, you still don't know. Um, I mean, 
the process is another thing altogether, and uh, and that's you know, that's a challenging thing in itself. And and I, I I think it's easy for anyone to sort of sit there and look at anyone who fronted up there and say they could have done a better job. But I can tell you um, that the lead up to that is is an extremely challenging experience. You get mm. you get notices to produce on a Friday um, that require a response by 10 a.m. on a Monday, mm. and it has to go to a third management document company. Um, before that, so it means it's got to be two pm on the Sunday. Yeah. So you know we've got we got fourteen staff. Mm. Um, we're not a major organisation, so we've got people who have to, had to work at least two three weekends. Um, and even even Poor Connor, <laughs> <laughs> Connor, Roz, Karen, um, the whole team actually pitched in, and even yeah. even leading up to the the hearing itself. Um, you know, we were yeah. told that we were going to be there on the Thursday. If there's anything more that they wanted to talk to us about, they'd let us know. And by five pm on the Tuesday, before Anzac Day, we hadn't received anything. So I thought well, at least we know the general. I mean, we've given them thousands of documents. But mm. At least we know within the witness statement what they're going to ask us about. Yeah. Um, Seven thirty on a Tuesday night before Anzac Day, we get another request for information to redact documents and provide them back to the Royal Commission by 4 p.m. Wednesday, Anzac Day. Wow. Yeah, um, right. So Jeez. That's a bit, that's a bit un-Australian, isn't it? So you then, Anzac Day, I can tell you, myself and Phil Anderson, we spent pouring, and our solicitor spent pouring over those documents to see what, you know, what have we done wrong? Is there anything that, you know, yeah. that we, we feel that we could do better yeah um what are they going to challenge us on so wow even that that process leading up there i don't think anyone appreciates that yeah well i caught up with a new client last night and and he's a lawyer works for a, a, one of the larger law firms in the city and they're representing uh cba and mm -hmm. um as for the royal commission he told me they've got a hundred paralegals working on it a hundred mm -hmm. so uh yeah and and look if you come back to your question about um you know, do we support it? I think everyone said, certainly from a financial advice perspective, we said we don't. We've already been through enough. But as obvious as long as you can find flaws, there's more. Yeah, there's more room. But what we need to think about is the human toll um, that's involved. And there's not only people participating. In, um, you know, there's there's thousands of advisors out there doing the right thing mm. um, that are supposedly you know tarred by the the same brush there's thousands of employees for amp all the banks who are working hard you know working their butts off mm. and some of them are ashamed to say who they work for because of what came out in the royal commission and that's really sad yeah that's un-australian yeah <laughs> if you want to talk about what's un-australian yeah obviously there it's a financial services is a huge uh, employer uh, of people but um, yeah, there are a lot of people that have been impacted. I know that like in my business, we're still getting new clients, but I've noticed with our marketing, you know, we do a lot of workshops. My numbers are right down uh, based mm. on where they were. At the start of the year, I was doing, you know, two classes a month with 30 people. Now it's it's uh, it's much lower than that. So I think it's definitely, my clients, were, it's like you, to your point, that when you talk to people that have advisors, they understand advice in my business where all fee for service we don't have any of the those sort of the issues that have yep. come under the spotlight but uh it still does make people sort of question yeah. and, and and doubt and 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 definitely you know we talk i remember think back to the to the gen x road show shortly after you started mark and talking about um the goal is to to crack that 20 percent number of australians getting advice uh feel like i i think that the like i was always for the royal commission but uh i think that that's definitely from a consumer perspective, uh, it's not helpful for bringing those numbers up and getting people the the results or the the, the help that they need to get the results they want. Yeah, it's and it might have to go backwards to go forwards, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, uh, people have said that you know it might drop from twenty percent down to fifteen percent. Uh, but the speaking to a lot of advisors, especially over this last month, it's very common to hear uh, that. A client saying to their advisor, oh, you know, thank goodness I'm with you. You know, I'm really happy yeah. what you're doing, but gee, there must be some terrible ones out there. So it's the advisors, the ones who have got relationships or built relationships with their clients are not hearing anything negative about themselves, but yeah. the people, first time probably, I in my memory of it, that people are really hearing what's in the media and are questioning their advisors, but mm. not so much what they've got themselves, which is, which is a healthy sign but uh, we do have a big job in restoring trust. No yeah. question. I think uh, I was talking to these other clients this morning and 
they were asking if they should they bank with AMP. I think a- AMP's got so much, yeah. so so much of it that uh, people are really they're not sure what they should do. Should they um, do I assure them that the products are the, are the products? But um, but yeah, I think yeah, people are and, rightly concerned. And people don't understand. And my mum's you know she's eighty. Um, she's she's in an AMP product. Uh, she's on on a platform, and she rang up and said it's with AMP. Is, is that okay? And she doesn't understand. Mm. Um, you know the, the difference between things, but she just just hears that, and that's that, you know that's that's resonated throughout the community. And as you say, that therefore it discourages people from you know that trust aspect is tr- discourages people from actually thinking about investing. Discovers discourages people from perhaps seeking advice. But as Mark said, uh, and I tried to illustrate as well, those people who do seek advice, you know, yeah. they do value it and they do trust the person that's giving them advice most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. And like the Sun Super guys have, had, they did all that research recently on Correct. the value of advice and and can see that and the confidence that it comes. And I think all advisors see that mm. uh, with with their, with their clients as well. So, should they break up aligned businesses? Well, I'm not sure if you've seen our submission and there's a follow-up to the, to the 28 questions from the Royal Commission. I tried to read it on my honeymoon and uh, the wife <laughs> didn't like it too much. <laughs> 29 pages, I think. I got through about four before she made me get off my phone. Um, and look, <laughs> we need a, a sustainable advice you know, profession and that comes in various sh- shapes and forms. Um, what we've argued is that vertical integration as it stands uh, does have conflicts but they're manageable and they provide different mechanisms for people to be able to access products and access advice. Uh, The key thing is to make sure that they are separate um, and that the advice is uh, in in the client's best interest Um, but by having uh, a model uh, that one supports the other I think that does provide uh, say another avenue for advice and vertical integration and doesn't have to be institutionalised. Uh, it can operate in small businesses as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you see this in the multi-business uh, unit businesses that uh, where people will have you know other services in house and they they all support uh, each other as well. So and, that, and even if you look products, at yeah. and if you look at the other responses um, to the twenty eight questions, choice um, ASIC. Um, and most of the other major institutions um, agreed that you know, in some way um, vertical integration is manageable. They didn't actually come out and say that it should be dismantled. Yeah. And so should with because because obviously this fee for no service and the trailing commissions thing was a, was a, something that was a lot of time was spent on. Uh, do you think that that should be removed? Like I think for like I, I know a lot of people that have built businesses around. Um, Around those those sorts of payments, and I've read some of the arguments around around the why we should keep them, but they they don't seem to carry much water for me. I sort of feel that with those products, if and although the fees are small, like if they if they were stripped out, then uh, the consumer is going to be better off. Like the, especially on the platform super fund side of things, like that's a competitive space. I feel that there should be. I get the argument about, well, maybe they've got some legacy insurance or something, but why can't there be a product? Created by the same business that takes on the same risk. So you're talking. You, so you're talking about fees for no service, or you're talking about grandfathering? Both. Of, like the it's the, that's the majority of the. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Just I'm just saying. That the, yeah, there's those trailing the, the trailing fees on all of the products where yep. people aren't serviced. There's there's businesses that have got tens of thousands of clients where that's clearly uh, happening. Um, but then, yeah, also the the. Whether to, whether to grandfather it because I think if they don't grandfather then it just gets sucked up into the product provider but surely people should just come out with more uh, other products that are cheaper uh, to allow people to access the cheaper mm. product so it's not just the company that's reaping all the benefit. Yeah. Say, saying that you're saying that you know there's plenty of advisors out there have ten thousand clients just sitting on these big books. There's a couple of things on that. One is we don't have the stats. And I think that's one of these big, uh, definitely Phil Anderson's very keen on finding out, well, if people are saying grandfather, we should switch it off. But why? What are the numbers? Is it a reducing number since FOFA brought it in? You know, we do need to actually get some facts about around this rather mm. than just these blanket statements. We should just cut out 
grandfathering. Um, so I think that's a really important part. But secondly, we all have now a best interest duty. So we can't just ignore, we can't just have 10,000 clients receiving income from and just ignore them uh, and just receive the trial committee. There is a duty on every advisor to go out there and to to write to every of these clients. And if they're not getting that, they've got, a, they've got an issue there. So there is legislation in place to deal with this. And I actually do think it's a reducing number of the people who've got these big books. I think that is... Uh, yeah, yeah, so, I'm not saying... I think, t- I'm not, uh, we just need some, and we just need some facts around it. I really am yeah. keen to hear how many of these are out there. But the reality is that, and that's why I asked the question at the beginning, the majority of focus was on fees for no service. Yeah. So it was around the institutions and how they treated advisors, whether it was under BOLA or was it transfer, um, whether or there was employed advisors, yeah. where there was a fee being deducted from the client's account, where there should have been... A, a service or advice provided, yeah, and, and it wasn't. Sure. Um, so there weren't, there wasn't, there wasn't an example of grandfathering. Yeah. In that, it was all talking about fees for for no service. So the the fact that the question of grandfathering came up um, is interesting because there wasn't a focus. There wasn't, as Mark said, mm. there wasn't any anecdotal evidence that people had been disadvantaged from you know prefo for grandfathering. Yeah. And the reason that you know we said that we don't support the removal of grandfathering is because there is firstly no evidence as to how much people are being detrimentally affected. Secondly, there's no guarantee that if you remo- remove the grandfathering that the fees, um, and usually they're a, a lower trail than, than, than the average, there's no guarantee that they'll actually come off the product yeah. and go to the client. Yep. As you said, they'll probably, they most likely go into the product itself. Yeah. Uh, there's possible go- buy-sell. Um, some of those products have surrender penalties um, and there's um, grandfathering of, of deeming um, for, mm-hmm. for many of those pension clients. So yeah. it's it's a big task just to say remove grandfathering because people, and as you mentioned, insurance as well, um, there yeah. is no evidence as to how much benefit there would be for what hasn't been identified as a disadvantage um, to the client. And the but fee for no service, though, none of us yeah. disagree with that. You, know, yeah. you should be getting, if you get a fee, you should be providing a service. Simple as that. Yeah, but yet there are business, I, and I, I will, just to clarify, I'm not saying there's heaps of businesses that mm. do it, but what I'm saying is I know of a, a, like a, a good handful of businesses that have done that just in, in my circle. Mm. Um, and I, I think like the, the licensees obviously have the stats because they... They see, you know, the, they have to uh, they have to account for mm. all, all of these payments, and they know mm. that the clients and um, you know when when people are buying and selling books, then there's transfers. Like the the records are, are there. Um, I sort of think that the grandfathering and the removal of grandfathering is a is a mechanism to remove the fees, right? The the mm. those fees for no service where the where the clients aren't getting serviced, um, and and the money's the money's still coming through because if it's if you stop the shifting, then it should just sort of, uh, you know, wean off over time as mm. well. But I think they could just strip out the strip out the costs, and the and the product provider should be compelled to create a a, a product that um, that doesn't have those those fees built in, and then is cheaper and if there's a legitimate reason for the person to stay in the product stay in the product because it's still there but otherwise go into a more competitive product because i think mm-hmm. you know there are examples and it's like we i saw a lot of this in the in the lift deba- debate from people mm-hmm. that wanted to hold on to the the status quo that you can come up with examples to say this is this this person with the deeming provisions is going to be um, impacted negatively if we remove it. But I I, I I think, and I don't have the stats. I'd be very interested to see mm. them. But that uh, probably the majority, and and I think probably the vast majority of people that are in these products with the with the trailing uh, grandfathered commissions are um, they're probably not going to be significantly negatively impacted if they if they were to change to it to a new product. It came it came up uh, probably about six or eight months ago. An example of this where an advisor or advisor member uh, said, "Well, yeah, I've got this old contract. I would want to move the client into a better contract uh, or better policy, but the product provider won't do it." And they said, "And they said, you know, Mr. Association, what can you do about this?" And we're sort of thinking, "Well, it's, it is a pretty hard one. You know, how how much can we influence a product provider to say you should do this?" Maybe the Royal Commission is what was needed to help that because uh, it is a bit of a conundrum. How do we uh, 
an influencer yeah. product provider to do that when we actually see examples the client is worse off where they are. Mm. But also remember, if you do go down that path, you're basically changing the law. You're affecting people retrospectively. Mm. There's probably going to therefore be compensation required. Um, mm. So as I say, it's what's the benefit outweighed by the disadvantage? And, and as I say, there wasn't um, a huge disadvantage, at least identified uh, through the evidence in the Royal Commission. I think the disadvantage is the is the trust that consumers have in the in the advisors, where they see that there's businesses where there's that are built around um, receiving these little small amounts of fees from all these different people, but not getting looked after the way that they should from a financial advisor. Like people, there's a there's a thirty basis points trail on a product, and an advisor's getting. $27.60 a year, That it says on that person's statement that they've got a financial advisor, mm. but they really don't because you can't give financial advice for $27.60 a mm. year. So mm. I think, in right. my opinion, I think it would just be better to say, if you don't have an advisor, you've got a product, you should be, maybe you should have an advisor, go and, go and pay them, you know, whatever the, the financial advice fee is so that you can actually have a financial advisor and get the benefits of financial advice. Yeah, and if, if one other benefit to come out of this is that people become more engaged and people do see a name of a financial advisor there and, and many of those advisors are servicing those clients and are contacting them and are available if they need to, to, to review their circumstances and are moving them into more contemporary um, products if the, the situation allows it. Um, but it's actually making empowering people to actually become more engaged and if they don't feel as if they've had the engagement from their advisor then they they're entitled to ask that question i hope it's empowering them to become more engaged but i don't know i think it's like it's it's that that's that's uh fear i think from from people that i don't know if it will drive engagement well it's, it's certainly been a call to action hasn't it yeah you know, i mean to it's, do it's been an yeah. interesting call to action because we've had clients ringing up and supporting their advisors. Yeah. Um, but I think everyone is taking a look at themselves and their business and making sure that, you know, if someone, you know, put the microscope on me, am I doing the right thing? Yeah, absolutely. Always a good thing. Yeah. And so should they, do you think they should be disclosing these these commissions? And commissions generally, I think that's one thing. Like there's obviously these carve-outs under, under FOFA and fee disclosure statements around these trailing fees and the uh, and the insurance commission side of things, um, and opt op, opt in like isn't that a solution for for fees for no service? Right? If you if you're charging someone a fee, they have to opt in. If they don't, you have to turn the fee off. That's like a mechanism to protect the consumer from making sure that they're getting looked after and and uh, engaged in I suppose their relationship. Is a should that be put put back on the table? Do you think? Well. That, that is there. So we do have to have a fee disclosure statement and we do have to switch it off if we don't get that. So that was brought in with FOFA. Um, but again, I think we just go back to, um, yes, you know, in theory, advisors shouldn't be receiving fees or commissions without any service, but it still would just like to know the facts behind it. Mm -hmm. Because if since FOFA, so it's 2014, if it has been, if we know it and we can find, as you said, through the licensees must know this, yeah. if it can actually be collected and we can see, okay, over the last four years, it's dropped from whatever it was, 100% when it first started, and it's now down to 40%, and it'll be two more years, it'll be gone. Well, then we don't have an issue. Uh, but if it's 100% and stayed at 100%, which I'd be surprised if it was, yeah. but until we actually have all the facts and figures, it's mm. pretty hard to sort of say, yes, this is what we should do. So is someone doing that or like getting those facts and figures? Who would do it? I think there's huge organisations... <laughs> I mean, if the if the regulator, and this is the interesting thing, that, that ASIC is being quite opinionated um, on a number of areas, um, that um, and they've got you know they've got the infrastructure to do that. And if there needs to be some more research, then then maybe there should be. Mm. Yeah, and they pretty well said, you know, we thought when we uh, had grandfathering there that it would be gone by now. And I said, well. Yeah, if you don't have any statistics, how do you know it's not nearly gone? Yeah. Uh, it's that sort of thing. You know, and they, they have the resources or should have the resources to be able to do this. Mm. I think we need to balance how do we... You, I mean, you know we're going through an extremely turbulent time. Um, the cost of advice is increasing. The cost to be an advisor is increasing. Uh, so the cost to provide advice is, is increasing and... I think if we looked at everything completely ideologically, um, we would have a very expensive advice model uh, and very few people would actually be able to, to, to get advice. 
Yeah, so that's my to, business model. We need to, to, to balance it um, so that we can enable people to access advice cost effectively and we can ensure that as many that advisors can give the right advice in the best client's best interests um, cost effectively as well. So what's the solution to that? The Keep sol- the commissions. The solution is to balance the interests so that we make sure that we have an effective uh, distribution model and effective profession. It's it's efficiencies. Yeah, we all talk about uh, people making nearly a living out of you know uh, scaremongering about robo advice. Yeah, uh, but it's to me the efficiencies of what that can provide to an advice firm um, to bring down the cost of providing that advice is the solution. For sure, we have to be yeah, far it's more be efficient. Technology. This Absolutely. is the same thing that Simple. people complaining about with the lift reforms. That oh, yep. I can't afford to service clients unless I'm getting 140 percent commission on yep. policy. It's like. Get a digital document uh, creation software thing, have yeah. a good database, and you can provide an SOA for whatever it costs you to sit in the meeting to deliver Absolutely. the advice. Like, and, and we're finding more and more that more of that uh, software providers, um, especially watching what's happening in the States, you know, you, you went over to FinCon, yeah. you saw what they're doing. Uh, it's uh, some great uh, applications that are coming out, to, but what we're finding is if advisors aren't going into competition with this, they're actually utilising this to bring down the cost of advice. And that's the future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt. We can't just sit there and say, let's protect everything and keep the status quo. Yeah, of course. And those surviving, you know, it's the old James, you know, Charles... Darwin, you know, through those, it's not it's not survival of the fit, fittest, it's those most adaptable to change. Yeah. And yes, people have to look for efficiencies, and some people won't won't survive the changes we're going through, um, and and they don't want to. Um, but it is about adaptability. It's about finding efficiencies. About using technology, uh, but it's also about making sure that anything that we do, you know, that we're not cracking a walnut with a sledgehammer, um, and making things so difficult and so complex uh, and so unaffordable that no one can actually can, can, can continue uh, to do what they need to do. Yeah. And do you think uh, just with the, um, the things around the bowler and, and uh, the, it more so in the aligned models, is that something that uh, you think will go or should go? Uh, I, I have no doubt that that's being looked at. I have no doubt that's being looked at. Mm-hmm. Your thoughts? Oh, I haven't really thought about it, to be honest. <laughs> There's so many things to think about. Yeah. Um, if, if, if affected properly, it should be a, an opportunity to realise the value of your business, but at the same time, when executed correctly, ensure that clients continue to get access to the, the service that they deserve. I think it's more the questions, though, around it is that, that should it be, um, should they be allowed to have, have higher multiples for you know, in-house, in-house products or, or the, the aligned products that are there. I think that's the potential for, for conflict on the, on the advice side. Yeah, and I think some of those anomalies were highlighted. Yeah. So mm-hmm. do you think uh, this will all affect the valuations of financial planning businesses? Short term, absolutely. Uh, we, we can see that already. But I think that's where it comes back to again. Uh, if you're looking at just product, just commission, just fees, that's only part of the story. You know, what, are, what systems do you have in place? What relationships have you built? What's, mm. your, what's your unique selling proposition or value proposition? All that's now part of the selling price. It's not the old, well, it's two times renewals or three times renewals. Yeah. Uh, I never agreed to that model, you know, never saw that, but that's what we traditionally have. Mm. Um, and we're just evolving from that. And I just see short term, if you're still wanting it based on a, a multiple, um, you're going to be pretty unhappy I would imagine over the next 12 months uh, but yeah, I think it will help other people to start building well how am I providing value what is the value in my business um, that's that's a good thing and what do you guys think will be the the, the outcome of, of the, the commission once the, the report comes out in wealth management and yeah. financial advice which was interesting there wasn't a lot of wealth management covered in the in the two weeks that wealth mm. management and financial advice was covered uh, look I think if you look at in total one of the key things was to look at the culture of the large organizations and does that culture um, you know does the culture then produce results that mean that the clients interests best interests aren't looked after? Is there a structure where people are incentivised to do the things that they shouldn't be doing 
uh, to the disadvantage of, of, of clients. And I think that's already coming out that, that you know, we need to look at the culture within organisations to say that, is there an issue there? Um, what are the incentives? You know, I know there's been some um, coverage around this, the changing in, of incentives for, for planners to be not revenue based. But unless those incentives carry all the way up the chain, it's not going to be as effective. I mean, it's great to have a balanced scorecard where your incentive is based on compliance and, and, and you know, whether it's um, net promoter score or, or, or whatever. But unless those incentives go right through the organisation, I think you know, that's not really going to, to get the effect that you want. So I think ultimately, if we can have uh, I think there's going to be a bit of a watershed in terms of culture and everyone's looking at things through a different lens and I know sometimes now we're looking at a decision saying, okay, so we're making that decision. Fast forward yourself to the Royal Commission of 2028 <laughs> yeah. and you're on the stand and you're asked, you know, so why did you make that decision, Mr Kewen? Uh, yep. So why did you make that decision, Mr Nash? I like and that approach. I feel <laughs> like the industry would be better for it if, uh, if all the decisions were made that way. And so if we have um, institutions that from top to bottom... Uh, notwithstanding all the good people in there from top to bottom have an approach where the culture is one of making sure that is this the right thing to do, um, then I think that will be a good good outcome. So in terms of whether that's legislating um, incentives, bonuses, um, management, whether you know, management are, are prosecuted as a result of this, I don't know. Um, what I'm hoping from an advice perspective is Yes, we'll go through some pain, as Mark said, but we'll come out of it and recognise that um, with some changes. And there were some good challenging comments, as I made earlier, about um, code monitoring bodies mm. and uh, multiple bodies and, and whether that's going to be effective. And uh, it was probably fair to raise that and, and that Absolutely, might be something yeah. to, to, to come up. I think, you know, when... We've, we've provided, you know, what we believe from EAFA uh, we want to happen. Uh, where it would land and uh, especially if you split grandfathering or commissions into investment commissions or super commissions to life insurance commissions well, we've got LIF it's in its infancy let it mm. let it have a chance yeah. so that's on that side but the other side uh, grandfathering we don't have the facts we want to know them uh, and we but we don't believe in fee for no service so yeah, that's what the AFA believe in. That's what that's our opportunity with the Royal Commission, with the politicians to influence, to get them to understand. Because there's a lot of headlines, and uh, and that's where we need to help them understand. Well, what does this actually? What does grandfathering actually mean? Um, because if you ask probably three different people, they'd have a three different versions of it. So yeah. it, there's our challenge for the next three six months before the Royal Commission, or while it's getting decided and when it finishes up, is how can we influence that. Yep. I mean, the concern I have is, is you know, you're asking what, what's going to come out of it. Uh, there was, I believe, an undue pressure on, uh, you talked about grandfathering, on commissions, uh, on risk commission, on whether you know, commission should be addressed again. And we've seen just, um, just recently with ASIC uh, coming out and talking about removing of conflicted remuneration completely. Um, we've just had the life insurance framework started. We're yeah. only four four months in, and to be talking already about removing commissions on 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 life insurance uh, is ridiculous. And we didn't see anything in the Royal Commission, uh, other than one example of a of a, a planner recommending a ridiculous amount of of insurance mm. uh, on the back of some other poor ad advice. Um, but apart from that, there was nothing in there. Was no call to action to say that. Uh, that uh, insurance commission is causing a problem. I and think we've all know, seen enough of seen enough of that with the through the through the process. With well, this the is, well, this is the thing, and that's why I'd hate to see this politicised to the extent that you know because maybe ideologically um, some people didn't see commission removed through previous processes that they use the royal commission to you mm. know to to do that with life something like life insurance because we know there is no model around the world that successfully enables people to get access to affordable advice on insurance alone um, other than, than the commission model. Well, yeah, I do fee-only insurance advice in my business, but it, I wouldn't say that it's affordable for all people. I can only do it because I, I've got a comprehensive process around the rest of the... That's right. And that's why I say insurance alone. Yeah, insurance yeah, alone. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but technology mm -hmm. should enable that at some point in the future. Don't you think they should disclose commissions, like life insurance commissions? We do. We do. On the... On fee disclosure statements, though, no, no, no. 
No, no, but on the statement of advice, yeah. to actually give the advice. Yep, but you give someone a statement of advice today and five years from now, you, they're just, you're just listed as the, the advisor on their, on their policy. They're not engaged in an ongoing fee arrangement. Um, you're not providing them updated statements of advice, then it's, it's no longer disclosed and it's easy for the, for the individual to forget, right? Yeah, true. I don't see why. I think that, you know, if people, if advisors are receiving a commission of hundreds and sometimes it's thousands of dollars on, on policies, I think it, uh, like consumers should be made aware of that because they say, I guarantee you, you get a letter or an email and it says your advisor got paid $1,000. If you haven't spoken to your advisor, you're going to call him up or you'll go find another advisor. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't disagree that, with that. Yeah. And saying that though, uh, anyone who is, say, a pure risk writer or life insurance writer, if they're not going back engaging their clients they're not going to build a relationship they're not going to keep those clients so it's like in any business model if you just ignore your clientele and always going after new business it's not a successful it's not yeah. a successful and we've got a best interest duty we can't just ignore them well the lift I, I think will probably solve that because it makes it less uh, attractive and, and lucrative I suppose to just um, you know get upfront commissions and then absolutely that's uh, true and, and then leave the clients but I think that there's still a lot because once you've got an insurance policy especially if you have a deterioration in your health you um, you're not going to go and change your policy most of the time people don't want to revisit they don't think about it except they think about the premiums and, and how they can cut them but um, I think it's. It, I think there's still probably a lot of people that aren't getting the service that they could, and and I think that if that was that disclosure was there, that they would be more likely to to look for that assistance. And I, and I have no doubt that you know a few years from now, when you know lift has been introduced and we've got ongoing higher ongoing commissions, that's going to be uh, much more topical. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. And so with just on the fazia and and. Um, the education and professional standards. There's obviously been all this stuff in the in the the Royal Commission and, and issues that have been highlighted, but mm -hmm. seems like none of those would be solved with this, uh, for you know, with what's been coming through. Do you think that 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 there should be some consideration of that in in how the the standards are set to make more of a focus on things like you mentioned culture and um, a, a, and ethics more so than it is now? Well, for CIA does address that as part of the. Okay, so for new advisors coming from the first year, January and being degree qualified, uh, but for existing advisors doing the transition, whether you've got a relatable or relevant degree or you just RG146 and you've got to say if it's where it settles on graduate diploma, well, there'll be three new subjects. One will be on ethics, one will be on behavioural finance, one will be on the corpse or, or governance. Uh -huh. um, so that's... That's not our typical uh, advanced diploma, or, uh, diploma yeah. we've had to do in past or our C CPD points in a lot of ways. So yep. there it, it is addressing ethics and, uh, and behavioural finance. So I think that's actually a positive move. Do you think it's going far enough? I haven't seen it yet. In terms of... <laughs> <don't> like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> not sure, I'm not sure what your question is. Like with the... With the the standards that they're proposing is it's we see these issues of um that that have been raised and, and whether there's there could be some tie in between the the professional standards that are set to maybe go some of the way to avoiding some of these issues that have happened um uh, i mean the first thing is you can't legislate for bad behavior <laughs> yeah, i suppose that's a good point or um, mm -hmm. and uh, or fraud and um and i believe even you know um yeah i mean even Kelly O'Dwyer, the minister, and, and other ministers recognise that even the most educated, and we saw it in the Royal Commission, you know, people had good qualifications, uh, did the wrong thing. Uh, so in terms of professional standards, uh, yes, it's to, to have a minimum level of education therefore means that from a community perspective looking in, they can understand that everyone's got a, a, a base, you know, an appropriate level of of education from an ethical perspective uh, i don't think there's anything wrong with having um you know for say a code of ethics which we're currently in the consultation period but everyone adhering to and spending time on on ethical standards um yeah absolutely uh, i you know i think everyone benefits from that uh, and done correctly you actually execute advice the best way for your client is the best outcome for you as well yeah absolutely yeah, and uh, one one last one with. Um, Where was the fun stuff? You said there was mm. some fun stuff in this. That was the, the fun stuff. The, the royal of, commission. The value of advice. Yeah. Um, so it, it, one of the things. The other guys are really. They had jokes and everything. 
Well, <laughs> come on, you, you go. Give us the joke. I saw some. I thought you were going to ask Mark about his background and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Huh? No. <laughs> no, 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 not today. Too, too much. Uh, too, I think you know this. This sort of stuff. I think it's everybody's important. asking questions. There's a lot Absolutely. of um, oh, a look, lot of misinformation uh, out there. And and as Mark mentioned at the start, the the media hype that uh, that surrounds a lot of these things. It's quite sensational. So. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are asking questions. Great to, to hear what you guys are doing. I know that, um, you know, like I had one of the questions I was, I was going to ask tongue in cheek, but around the, you know, the role of the associations, you look mm. at, and we've spoken about this before, Phil, you look at something like an MDRT where there there is a, like a train, they're an association, but it's like a training association. They don't get involved in any of this stuff. And I've obviously been a volunteer for the AFA for the last seven, seven years or so. And yeah. Uh, this stuff it's i had a question from dean asking about like consumer education because consumer education is about financial advice is something that probably could go a long way to um to to helping more people get more advice cracking the glass ceiling and doing all that sort of stuff but i know that you guys are so consumed like you say working all uh anzac day very un-australian to um to do this stuff so it's a, it's obviously it's a huge impost on the associations and it's uh seems like for the last it's certainly the time that i've been involved you um the whole team at the afa brad fox before you uh phil and um and sam as well like it's just uh it seems all consuming and it seems to me like such a shame that you're you're an association you, you've got resources you could help push the industry for, forward or like do things to enhance and make um make it easier for advisors but it's we're trapped into being reactive around um well i think these it, legislative change that it's there's no doubt that 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 takes up um a lot of energy <laughs> mm. um but we've continued to do what we need to do and and do some really positive things I and mean, i've just come off the back of the inspire roadshow we've had over 550 attendees around australia um in what has just been an energetic um, event uh, where we're inspiring more women to, to follow financial advice careers, empowering more women to step up and, and, and advocating for more issues um, for, for women to get financial advice and for the, the community and for the government to actually advocate for, for, um, you know, for financial advice. So that's been going on. We've had our Connect Roadshow a couple of months ago um, where we had over 1,000 attendees um, and the same thing, it's all about focusing on the things that we can control yeah, and the positive things and, and sharing the positive stories that, that people like Mark you know, go through every day, except when he comes in the office with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've continued to do that. Um, we've continued to add content to the YBI website. Uh, we have over 6,000 views per month now. Um, and I still implore anyone who's an, an AFA member, if you're on Find My Advisor, go in and update your profile. People are now looking. We're getting more referrals from the ASIC website. We're getting more people as a result of this. I talked about earlier the call to action. There are more people coming in and actually looking for financial advisors, Mm -hmm. but they're looking for good financial advisors who understand them. So again, I'd implore anyone who's got their profile to update it because people are looking at them and they want to see that this person understands me and uh, and I can actually contact them and they can actually help me. So we're doing all of those good things. I know that's the promo, but it's not as if everything's <laughs> right. it's not as every as if everything has has stopped. Um, and we've done a lot of work on our compliance. You know, it was interesting going into the Royal Commission saying well, we've had 19 issues over the last five years, mm. you know, nine complaints and eight incidences uh, which are f- effectively self-reporting. So what, what should we be concerned about? And that's because, you know, we're not, at the moment, we're not in the chain of, of complaint command, you know, advisor, licensee, um, and then, you know, wherever it goes from there, whether it's FOS or ASIC, uh, but those that we've, every complaint that an issue that we've dealt with, uh, that we've received, we've dealt with. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And and from my point of view, you know, the, Phil uh, Q&H here and Phil Anderson, and they're, as you seem, say, reactive, but they they are the voice. They are there, they are there to influence government. They are there to meet with the regulator and you know, front royal commissions if they have to. But definitely from us, from a board point of view, we definitely, one of our fears of engagement is the community engagement. And that's not just our membership, but that is actually the consumer. Uh, If we become a professional uh, body, that our focus is definitely directly uh, to the consumer, how we are, how we as advisors and members can help the community in um, more than we are now. And, and as you said, you know, you've been part of the AFA, you volunteer, a big push of what I do is they're saying, well, 
you know, what I really like about this association with this long history is that we always get 15, 20% of our members volunteer. And it's only once you do get in, uh, volunteer, whether it's one of our community practices, uh, you actually get to see the work the AFA and, you know, the FPA and other associations are doing uh, on behalf of the members. And it's, it's just, it, uh, it is unfortunate when you do see comments outside saying, oh, you know, these associations do nothing. And so, well, have you actually ever been to a meeting? Have you ever been yeah. to an event? Well, Absolutely. no. So it's just yeah. what I've been told. And it's yeah. only when someone like yourself who actually gets involved and actually sees the work and see, you know, people rolling their sleeves up and actually getting in for yeah. the benefit of uh, this industry and this profession, yep. uh, that's what we want to keep doing. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's why you know it's it's always good to to get you guys on and, and talk about what's what's happening. We've been doing this for for years. When um, uh, Foxy was under fire with the with the lift stuff, we got him on because you can, as you rightly say, you can from the outside. It's easy to say, well, they they're copying it. The media are obviously slamming everybody, mm. um, and no one's doing anything. But you know, working yeah, on and, Anzac Day, and, and that's so. what that's what people. And it's not. Yeah, I'm not complaining about working on yeah. Anzac Day. In I, no, I'm complaining about you at work on Anzac Day. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, um, Unacceptable. Um, and you, you don't get much sleep in the lead-up to those, those sorts bet. of things either. But um, uh, I, I guess the thing is that there are a lot of things going on. We st- we're still meeting with the regulators, with ASIC. Um, we're still meeting with politicians on a regular basis. We go down to Canberra. We advocate. Um, at times, it's not flavour of the month. Um, when it... You know, the sorts of things that really help me get up in the morning is, is you know, say so we've just had the Inspire Road Show. We had Jackie Cooper, who's former Olympian, um, you know, 39 times yeah. world champion, um, best in her field. And, you know, she said she really didn't know what to expect. She was coming to a financial services um, road show, didn't know what that meant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry? That's funny. Um, or well, she's an ambassador. Yeah. Um, she's not actually um, involved in it on a day-to-day basis. And she yeah. just said to me, this is amazing. Mm. What you guys do is amazing. And the fact that, you know, the whole community that is turning up for each of these events, she said, and technically you're competitors, but you're prepared to get together as a community and share so that all of you can improve yourself. So that what yeah. you do um, is better for everyone. She said, that's really powerful. And she brought a friend on uh, of hers along um, from the media in Melbourne as well, and he just said, "I just can't believe you guys do this." Yeah, I was surprised about that when we first uh, when I first came into the industry as well. I think I was told the story a bunch of times, but um, yeah, I, uh, obviously that's how we're all it's you collaborate, know. not competition, as Leah Shadell absolutely often says. Yeah, yeah. you know, people like Lee Shadell who you know um, epitomises the health and well-being uh, yeah. of, of financial advice, and and you could see people seeing her as a role model and we had lots of fantastic successful women um, Mm. showing how they were role models and how they were doing the best thing for themselves and their clients and the profession Um, good stuff they're the sorts of things that energize you absolutely yeah and so how can people get involved with the afa what do you guys got coming up what do people do to get engaged uh well in terms of engagement what i would say is you said before that a lot of people are looking from the outside in uh, read some of the information that's coming out. I think we did a survey and less than 70, uh, in fact, nearly 70% of people said they hadn't read the the, um, the proposed FASIA code. Uh, so if we really want to be participants and we really want to critique what's going on, read the stuff. <laughs> Is uh, there a, um, a more fun way that people can get involved? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there's... there's well, well, you didn't make this fun, but <laughs> so, now you talk about it. So, it's like we've yeah, got to make the fun. You told me to make a okay. joke. We've got to make the fun. So, I mean, but no, it is important because uh, we're in a foresee consultation period. Uh, it's not just limited to us. Everyone has a voice. Yes, we have. Um, we have a, a royal commission committee. We have policy advocacy committee. Um, so we have members' voice in there, and so we're doing our best to make our submissions on behalf of the members. But um, members and the, the the advisor population need to to if they really feel passionate about this make a submission regarding the code make a submission about um, professional standards um, but do the fun stuff as well yep. get, in, get involved in community practice I hear Gen X is a fabulous community to get involved that's in that's what I hear as well yeah. and, and it's just got better apparently <laughs> this got a, they've got a really good new national chair yeah. that's next month isn't it yeah. and this coming Thursday in New South Wales in Sydney I so know. James is uh, running the next 
around uh, the country on Thursday. Just around the Ails country. And Tails that's now. this coming Trish Thursday. And Trish has put a stamp on things. Yep. And that's there. all I encourage anyone to do. If they want to know about the AFA, just come along to an event. Whether yeah, so it's I that Gen it's X or the next practitioner roadshow you see it if you like it um enjoy hearing the message well then yeah you'll find your local community leader or state director and, and get involved and come to conference yeah the best way to get together and really share the afa community really share everything that's positive um and learn the how to do from from your peers mm. uh, is come to conference october and October 10th to 12th. Yep. And RACV. <laughs> and you're not going to be away this time, are you, Ben? No, but I'm here, front and centre. Good. And But just actually why, uh, you know, the XY, it seems to me, works so well is because it's your peers helping peers. Uh, yep. You know, someone will have a problem. What has everyone else done that uh, is doing in that area? That's where I really love conference. Yes, we get main speakers, international speakers, but we always at least have 50 or 60 of your peers mm. speaking. And that's always been a focus of ours is that because we know uh, advisors want to hear from other advisors and and we do that in spades. Plus you get to see Steve Crawford really hung over on on the last day, which is always a a pleasant (laughs) sight. Absolutely. Um, Just one thing uh, you mentioned about this submission. I think something that that stops a lot of people from doing that is that they think that it has to be a very legalistic sort of uh, extensive type document. But I know uh, from the from the past conversations that I've had with people, you guys are happy to receive anything, short few sentences, bullet points, whatever, right? Is that right? We're, we're happy to get any feedback directly ourselves. Um, and you go to the website and the link's uh, there to, to give us feedback. But by the same token, for FASEA professional standards and the code, that can go directly to, to FASEA. Um, and the voice of many, even though you know, we represent over you know, 4,400 members, um, the voice of those 4,400 when supported by individual representations, obviously is that much more powerful and it personalises it a bit more. Absolutely, and I know that you guys read all of the, the submissions, don't get very many or not as not nearly as many as you'd like. So um, we, we very rarely, when we ask for, for comment, um, we very rarely get a lot uh, of feedback. Well, Phil Kewen, Mark Bynum, gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Ben has. Thank, thank you very you much. Ben.